Over there, over there. Send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming. The drums rum coming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer. Our program today, I think probably most of you know what it is because that's why you're here. We have a nice big crowd for you, Mandy. Um, it is our very own Mandy Pond, who is the archivist here at the museum. She's been here 10 years. She's a KSU grad, and so she takes care of about 17,000 documents and well over 60,000 photographs here at the Madison Museum. So uh, you can see they're in good hands. She's also an extremely creative photographer. Uh, if you want to see her work, there is a show across the street at the Raymond James office in the Lincoln Theater building. Um, she also just had a, an amazing project uh, that included fairy tales, or that it was all about fairy tales, and those books are available. So um, she's an amazing creative woman. Um, and I know that she was very creative when she did her Titanic program, which I believe you did 42 <laughs> times. <laughs> so she must have known that pretty well um, by the time she was done giving those. Um, she has just developed this World War I program, so you are among the first to see it. I would love to introduce to you my dear friend and protege, I say she's a work in progress, but she may not want to be me, so <laughs> I'll hand over the program before I get weepy. Yay, thank you all so much. We have a wonderful crowd, and uh, I know that some of you came specifically to hear this, so I hope I do it justice, so thank you. Yes. Uh, Titanic has been extremely popular, but uh, of course moving on to other anniversaries of the uh, 100th, uh, of course we move into uh, 2014 being the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. Uh, and just so you know, we haven't um, forgotten that here at the museum. Uh, we do have a display of Charles Vernon Brown artifacts on the lower level that Heather has put together. And uh, in 2017, we're looking to pull out all of the things that we have related to World War I. So look for a much bigger uh, exhibit then. That'll be the uh, 100th anniversary of America's involvement in the war. So, uh, so in order to start this talk off, I want you all to understand why and how uh, we, got, we got involved in World War I. So uh, I did commission some of you in the audience uh, with some countries. Uh, if I could have my countries come up here uh, so that we can illustrate just how this all happened. Yay! Awesome. All right. Brilliant. You guys are great. All right. <laughs> All right. If you guys can line up that way so we can, these lovely people can uh, see. Thank you guys. Yes. So lots of countries involved, as you can see. All right. So uh, Chris Kraft here, if you could step forward. You are Austria Hungary. All right. So Austria-Hungary in 1882 decided that war might be something that could happen in the future. So 1882, uh, Austria-Hungary signed an alliance with Germany and Italy. So where's Germany? There we go. So Germany and Austria-Hungary were friends and they knew that if something should ever happen that they would have each other's backs. So these, uh, these guys signed that contract. So France, where's France? Poor France. France has this beautiful Alsace-Lorraine region that kind of butts up against both countries. <laughs> She's so lovely. We need. So unfortunately, France, uh, during the 1870s, lost its Alsace-Lorraine region to Germany. So France had a, a, a pretty, pretty big anger uh, towards Germany. So uh, let's see. Uh, OK, so you can uh, step back, Austria-Hungary, stay put. All right, so Serbia, if you could step forward. This is my mother, everyone, my wonderful, supportive mother, Deb. Thank you. Yes, fantastic. All right, so poor little Serbia is sitting here, and uh, Austria-Hungary annexed this country in 1908. <laughs> and Austria-Hungary uh, decided that they didn't like the Serbians, and they were going to start teaching Austria uh, the Hungarian language to their schools. They started enlisting the Serbians in their army. Not a great place. They were beaten up on poor Serbia here. So, <laughs> it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. So, poor Serbia. Serbia starts to get a 
little bit upset. So in 1914, uh, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, visits uh, Sarajevo. So uh, the heir comes to the city hoping to patch things up, make things okay, and make, make an appearance, do a little wave. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, the Serbians are not happy with that. So the, uh, the militant group, the Black Hand, uh, gets an assassin, uh, Gavrilo Pranci, to murder the Archduke. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> I knew he would be so very dramatic. <laughs> All right, so poor Franz Ferdinand has been killed on June 28, 1914. Now here's the weird part. This is the thing that launches us into war. In all of the newspapers, it's a little tiny blurb in the newspapers, like, oh, by the way, this guy died somewhere in Europe. Awesome. <laughs> Moving on. No one really seemed to care. So, uh, obviously, Austria-Hungary did care uh, because their heir was murdered by the Serbians. They already didn't like him to begin with. So Austria-Hungary gave Serbia uh, a list of very important things that had to happen. Basically, uh, uh, Austria-Hungary was going to put in a puppet government. They were going to start uh, stealing away the Serbians to serve in their army. Lots of things that they had to agree to so that they wouldn't declare war. Serbia, not very happy. So Serbia said no. So Austria-Hungary <laughs> declares war. Bum, bum, bum. Here we go. So World War I, starting out, really a conflict between two countries. Didn't have much to do with the rest of the world. You guys are great. <laughs> now, if you'll remember, we signed that alliance back in 1882. So Germany starts, uh, joins in with Austria-Hungary, declares war. So here she joins in. Uh, now, Russia, did I put Russia? Is somebody Russia? Awesome. All right, Russia comes to the aid. Of course, Russia has a very soft spot in their heart for poor Serbia. So Serbia and Russia here. Now, of course, you see, we've got two fronts kind of happening. We've got all of these people fighting. Uh, and of course, uh, France, in uh, wanting to regain its Alsace-Lorraine region and hoping to help, France joins in on our uh, side over here. There we go. All right, yay. All right, we're going to fight for the rights. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have, uh, let's see, the British Empire joins in. You've got the United Kingdom. You've got Australia. Yes all kinds of other places, and then the Ottoman Empire, they want to get in on the fight. So we've got the Ottoman Empire, all right? You're fighting, excellent. This is really weird. You're, you're red, you're on, you're on Austria-Hungary. All right, perfect, thank you guys. Okay, so you can see these guys started to get involved because they wanted to help their other countries. They didn't really have a, an investment in what was going on in Serbia. They wanted to help each other out or they had a vendetta against these other countries. Uh, let's see what we have. Okay, so uh, also fighting for uh, our side, uh, along with the British Empire, Russia, Serbia, we had Japan. Japan actually fought on the same side as we did during World War I. Interesting fact. We also have Romania, Belgium, Greece, Portugal, and then Marky Vote here is representing our neutral countries. All right, you guys can step, take a, take a big step back. Thank you, thank you. If you can show the countries. We've got Denmark, we've got Luxembourg, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, the countries that typically stay neutral in a conflict of this sort. Uh, so those people stayed out of it. Okay, thank you all very much, countries. Give them a big hand for the lovely fight. <laughs> In charge, of course, we can't uh, we can't go into war without someone to vilify. We have to make a bad guy. So Kaiser Wilhelm, he doesn't look too bad. His mustache is kind of frightening. 
Uh, but of course, we have to propagandize this gentleman. So here we show Kaiser Wilhelm with a very, very angry face. And he is, he is eating the world. He is taking over the world. Now, Germany does a lot of things to make us vilify him. Uh, he sent in his troops uh, into Belgium. And uh, unfortunately, they started taking people out of the town, shooting them for no reason whatsoever. Uh, there were lots of stories of rape and pillaging. Not great. So the Germans do some bad things to kind of warrant this. But again, remember, Austria, Hungary, and Serbia are the two countries who were involved to begin with. So uh, the focus kind of shifts to the Kaiser. Uh, and during uh, the war, there were many battles, but I'm not really good at troop movements and those kinds of things, so I'm not going to talk much about actual battles. But just to give you an idea of the casualties uh, in World War I, uh, the Battle of the Somme took place in France in 1916. In just the very first day of the battle, uh, the British Army suffered more than 60,000 casualties. And by the end of that offensive, more than 420,000 men were killed. Now, to put that into perspective, in the Civil War, about 600,000 men were killed. So, really, really high numbers. Of course, we got really, really good at killing each other by uh, 1914, uh, but uh, a lot more people involved, but really bad, bad battles. So, America really didn't want to get involved. Uh, we did help some of these allies, uh, France and uh, England, with supplies. So, we would send them over in ships, uh, hoping to help them out, but we didn't want to send men over because, again, what would we be fighting for? Uh, so President Wilson was actually reelected in 1916 on the auspices that he kept us out of war. So America was just fine to sit on the sidelines. Uh, in 1915, German U-boats started attacking ships because they realized that supplies were on these ships, so they wanted to stop that. So they did sink the Lusitania, which had 128 Americans aboard. Some people wanted to go to war at that point because it was an un, uh, unnecessary attack, uh, but President Wilson said, hey, Germany, could you please stop torpedoing our passenger ships? And they actually complied for a couple of years. So we were still okay, he gets elected, keeping us out of war, awesome. Uh, but unfortunately in 1917, the U-boats actually start attacking. And then the German, the, uh, sorry, the British uh, intercept this telegram from Germany sent to Mexico. This is the Zimmerman telegram. So uh, the, uh, the idea was that Germany was going to get Mexico to get involved in the war. They said, Mexico, if you can invade the U.S. from the south, we will help you to regain the territories of uh, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona that you would have lost back in the Mexican War of the 1840s. Well, America doesn't take very kindly to threats of that sort. Um, so. Uh, uh, President Wilson takes this telegram, publishes it in all the newspapers, uh, and then goes to Congress uh, to ask uh, Congress to declare war. So there we are. Uh, there is President Wilson in April of 1917 declaring war. So we come in pretty late to the game. So the war's already been going on for three years. Um, you know, of course, uh, much like World War II, we step in kind of at the end of the day to save the day. Um, so immediately we pass the Selective Service Act in 1917 and we draft 2.8 million men. And uh, because uh, Americans are fired up, two, more, uh, two million more men uh, actually volunteer uh, to get involved. And women, of course, not being able to enlist in the service, uh, actually serve in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps, so that is part of their contribution. At the most costly uh, time of the war, it cost us about a million dollars an hour, and this is 1917 dollars. So a million dollars an hour. The total cost being 21 billion. So 21 billion dollars in 1917 monies is, is pretty high. So immediately, uh, our production goes over to producing the things that are required for war, because of course we weren't thinking that we were going to get involved. So, to give you just a couple of facts and figures, uh, we produced 8.2 billion rounds of rifle and machine gun ammunition, 1.8 billion pounds of high explosives, 227,000 machine guns. So we sent a lot of things over there, and those are just the, the big numbers. 
Of course, this is the very first time that that many countries were actually involved, and that's uh, why we think of it as a world war. It was never called World War I at the time because we didn't know that there was going to be a second one. So it was never called that. Wilson uh, called it the war to end all wars because he believed that no one could ever uh, make this happen again. Unfortunately, of course, we know that he's wrong. Uh, people would refer to it as the Great War, the Necessary War, uh, or the War to End All Wars. <laughs> so how do we get people involved in this war effort? How do we get them excited to, to help out? Uh, we have to produce propaganda. And uh, I put some posters up there on the wall, and then I'm going to show you a few others. So for this, because I'm going to do quite a few, we'll just hold one up and just, yep, there we go. So uh, we have to tug at the heartstrings. Uh, this gentleman uh, says for home and country. So remembering that you have to protect your loved ones at home. That makes perfectly good sense. Uh, this one, Daddy, what did you do during the Great War? So thinking about in the future, how will you explain to your children what you did during the war? Will you tell them that you were a coward or will you have enlisted? Keeping in mind for the ladies who like to party, that to dress extravagantly in wartime is worse than bad form. It is unpatriotic. <laughs> so don't don't forget for one minute that we are in fact at war. <laughs> and of course, we want everyone to can, much like the Victory Gardens of World War II. We did the same thing. We wanted everybody to plant their own food and can so that they could have their food. So can vegetables, fruit, and the Kaiser too. So here we have the Kaiser again in a, a bad situation. And if those things don't work to uh, get you involved in the war, we can use scare tactics. So here are some bloody German boots, and it says keep these off the USA. Because of course, if they're starting to contact Mexico and they're going to want to invade, this is a very real possibility. And remember how I said that the Germans were very nasty to Belgium? Well, here we are. Remember Belgium with a, a very striking image, which knowing what went on there, we don't want that to happen here either. So we have to help Belgium and the other countries who are uh, unfortunately being uh, put down. Hold on, there we go. And of course we need money. $21 billion is a lot. So a lot of Liberty Loan campaigns. Uh, this one, if you goose step, or if you sidestep now, you will goose step later. So, give to the war chest. And something, of course, that we always think of as freedom and liberty, the Statue of Liberty. So here is New York Harbor uh, up in flames, that liberty shall not perish from this earth. Please give to the Liberty Loan Campaign. Okay, thank you. Uh, and of course, as I said, we found new ways to kill each other. Uh, as technology advances, so do uh, war technologies. So uh, mustard gas was used uh, pretty heavily. Uh, the unfortunate part is that many people didn't know that they had inhaled the mustard gas because uh, they would walk through an area and it was only until later uh, that they discovered that. I will not describe to you what that uh, did, uh, but for many it caused temporary or permanent blindness. Um, a lot of chemical burns on the skin and in your respiratory system. Never under any circumstances should you image Google search uh, injuries during World War I. That is my, that is my note to you, just don't do it. Um, of course, the German U-boats. Uh, America had been using uh, submarines since the Civil War. Obviously, we got a lot better at them by this point. Uh, this is the first time that motorized vehicles, such as tanks and cars, were used in warfare to get troops and supplies where they needed to go. Automatic machine guns. Uh, since the Civil War, when you could load one, maybe two bullets per minute, well, now you can have machine guns that could just continue shooting and shooting and shooting. Uh, and trench warfare. Instead of lines of men going towards each other, uh, th this time they realized that if they dug trenches, uh, they could more easily uh, hide themselves. But the problem with trench warfare is that once you've dug that trench and that the enemy has another trench over there and you've got this kind of no man's land in between, well, the minute that you get out of your trench, they can immediately shoot you. So uh, at some points in time, a lot of the, uh, the entrenched men had nowhere to go. They couldn't move a lot of stagnation in movement. So they were kind of just in their trenches for long periods of time. 
And of course, while you're in the trench, uh, there's lots of things like water that gathers. Um, so a lot of uh, keeping your socks wet was very, or dry, it was very important. Um, trying to entertain yourself. Again, if there's a lot of stagnation, uh, there wasn't a lot to do. All right, let's see. Okay, so another thing that we used, uh, this is actually a Civil War photograph uh, that Chris Kraft talked about in his Civil War technologies. Um, balloons were very important in uh, getting to see troop movements. Uh, sometimes was used for supplies, <coughs> uh, moving them across. Uh, but as you go up in the air, you can uh, actually telegraph down uh, and tell them where the troops are. And this is a German uh, balloon. They call them flying sausages, uh, which is pretty, pretty good yeah. description for uh, what those look like. And of course, uh, people weren't quite buying into the uh, into motorized vehicles just yet. They were still relatively new. So horses were used extensively. Uh, there were more than a million horses that served in World War I. And they could travel better than vehicles through mud and rough terrain and uh, you know, over those trenches. Uh, the Allies actually prevented the Central Powers from importing horses to replace those that were lost. Um, so we, we put a stop to them getting horses. Um, there were many veterinary hospitals on the front. Uh, they actually used Clydesdales, those ones that they use for Budweiser ads. They used them to haul very heavy machinery and heavy guns. Of course, it's very difficult to feed that many horses, so that was a big war expense. Um, and Britain, uh, over the course of the war, lost 484,000 horses, uh, which is one horse for every two men killed. So, very important, and of course they are on the front lines with you, and if you shoot the horse, the man comes off, and then it becomes much easier to kill him. So, uh, there are many memorials that exist today for horses, um, so they were very fondly thought of, um, because of course they are the thing that are keeping you going. Uh, airplanes were used for the uh, very first time in a major uh, conflict. Of course, the Wright brothers uh, had started flight in 1903 with their first successful flight. Uh, so for the American side, we have Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, you might remember the, uh, the song Snoopy vs. the Red Baron. Um, so uh, plane fights were, were quite... Uh, quite a sight. Uh, here, Eddie Rickenbacker had uh, 26 victories. He shot down 26 planes. Um, that's, of course, an estimation. Uh, when they talk about shooting down planes in World War I, you had to have someone else on the ground actually confirm that you shot someone down. So if you're on the, on the ground actually fighting and there's a plane battle going on, I don't know how they're supposed to pay attention and confirm that you shot them down. So 26 victories-ish. Uh, and then the Red Baron, uh, whose real name is Manfred Albrecht Freier von Richthofen. Uh, he had 80 victories. Um, so he was the, the fiercest fighter pilot for Germany. Uh, he had 80 confirmed victories, uh, but he was actually killed in April of 1918. So we put a stop to that. Now, as far as Massillon's connection to flight, you may remember Joe Herrick did a wonderful brown bag on Reinhard Osmus. Uh, Reinhardt lived here as a boy, and he and his uh, cohorts built a plane in the old Arlington Hotel. And uh, he signed up for uh, the war very early, so he is considered one of the early birds in World War I. And uh, he did go over. The unfortunate part is that uh, Reinhardt uh, crashed. Luckily, it was, uh, he crashed on the field where he was practicing. Uh, but unfortunately, he does crash and doesn't actually see any action. But there is Reinhard Osmus, Massillon's own. So, uh, Massillon, hold on, let me get water. Stark County put together a beautiful book, which I have up here some selected pages from. Uh, it is the Honor Roll Book of Ohio, and it does show photographs of every soldier who served in World War I. I did not bring down the whole thing. Uh, they are not organized alphabetically or in any way, shape, or form. They are just photos all stuck together. Uh, but it does talk about industry and, and things of that nature. It's a really cool book. So if you want to make an appointment up in the archives, I'd be more than happy to show you. Um, but in the introduction to that book, uh, there is a quote that I think really sums up uh, Star County. Where in all history, sacred or secular, and where in all this wide land is there any evidence of greater patriotism than was shown by Stark County, Ohio? 
And I think that that definitely carries on to today, that Stark County is very much involved. We take good care of our veterans. Uh, we do recognize them as often as possible, and they do serve. Uh, so Stark County provided uh, Company K of the 146th from Alliance. Uh, we had Massillon and Minerva making up Company A of the 136th Machine Gun Battalion. Uh, we had started out as Company K of the 10th, uh, but then got incorporated into that Machine Gun Battalion. Canton provided 145th Ambulance Company, and then all of the miscellaneous places in Stark County made up the 332nd. Uh, so, our boys here, I do have a large photograph of uh, our boys out in front of City Hall. There's another photograph of our boys in World War I. There were 127 men from uh, Maslin who made up this company. Uh, they went to train in October of 1917 at Camp Sheridan, Alabama. Of course, they had to be trained to use these new machine guns. In early 19, uh, July of 1918, they arrived in France ready to go. They carried about 70 pounds of gear uh, everywhere they went. So when they were marching, they were carrying 70 pounds of gear. Uh, they were part of the Meuse Argonne campaign in September of 1918, and their biggest claim to fame was that they held St. Mihiel in France for 10 days. So here's a photograph of them holding that city in France. Which of course it's important once you gain land that you have to leave someone behind to guard it so that you don't lose it again. Uh, unfortunately, several of our men in Company K were wiped out by mustard gas in October of 1918. Uh, and they were part of the uh, Sinjum attack on November 10th, and uh, the armistice was called on November 11th in 1918. Uh, so many of the men stayed behind to guard the area and came back to America and were mustered out. Come on, they're here somewhere. They were mustered out in 1919. Hold on, it's a really cool photograph. I'd really like to show it to you. So many papers. There it is. Okay. All right. So uh, this photograph was taken uh, in Cincinnati with uh, 21,000 men. So each one of those dots that you see is a man. And uh, they wanted to recreate the head of uh, President Wilson. So I thought that was pretty, pretty neat. <laughs> All right, so in charge of Company K uh, was Captain Harry O. Curley. I guess this one will be better to show you. Uh, he actually does have a street named after him. There is a Curley uh, Avenue here in Maslin. You can go ahead and take that one. I'll just show you that. So he was a lovely guy. Uh, Captain Curley had actually served in the, uh, in the Spanish American War. Uh, after World War I, he was promoted to major in 1924. And upon retirement, uh, he was actually involved with uh, the security forces at Republic Steel. And uh, unfortunately, he was part of the controversial Little Steel Strike in 1937, uh, supposedly giving the order to fire on the protesters. So bad guy, bad guy. <laughs> Uh, so all in all, from Maslin, Ohio, we had 1,000 men who were drafted. Uh, 17 Maslin men were killed uh, during the war. Maslin's own Robert Pete Skinner, who was an ambassador, served in Berlin and London during World War I. Uh, he is best known as uh, the gentleman who went uh, as commissioned by Teddy Roosevelt to Ethiopia in 1903 to open up the trade routes. Uh, as I mentioned before, Maslin's own Charles Vernon Brown. Uh, if you'd like to see uh, information on him, there's a lovely display downstairs. Uh, he, uh, his letters exist here in the collection. Uh, we have 200 letters, photographs, and personal artifacts. And uh, Sandra Perlman, back in 1989, wrote a play based on those letters called Dear Mother and All. Uh, so we have some snippets of that video downstairs. And uh, Sandra and I and Heather are going to work together to hopefully revive that play. Uh, sometime in the, the next few years so that people can see that again because I think it's a really great way to engage people in World War I. So on the home front, what time is it? Okay, good, we're doing good. Uh, on the home front, of course, it's not all about the soldiers. We also have to make sure that we're not importing a lot of goods and that we are saving food. Uh, it's important to be frugal. So there was rationing. Uh, we, of course, want everyone to buy war bonds and loans. And uh, one of the biggest 
concerns was sugar. Uh, this is a poster that's in the museum's collection. Um, because sugar was not grown here, we had to import that. But that takes ships to bring that to our shores. Uh, so here we have a woman who is drinking a soda uh, through a straw, but as she's uh, drinking that soda, it's sucking the ships away from the war effort uh, to bring the sugar to our land. So a really good visual uh, to remind you that the more soda you drink, uh, the more ships are going to be used to uh, go away from the war effort. So a very, very smart choice. Uh, and of course, in Massillon, uh, we did have a German scare. So as Germany is the bad guy, we don't like to associate with Germany. So uh, in New Berlin, becomes North Canton. Um, there were German sympathizers here who were uh, raising money uh, and spying for Germany. Um, so there was a Sedition Act in 1918 to try and stop that and uh, quell any Germans who may have uh, connections to home. The Massillon Area Chamber of Commerce helped the Liberty Loan Campaigns raise $7.2 million, which is recent. Uh, the Massillon Women's Committee was or, uh, organized a Council of National Defense, so just in case Germany should come over here and start bombing us, we would be prepared. There were 1,500 housewives who pledged to conserve food, and they signed uh, an agreement to that, uh, to that effect. And of course, there were many Stark County companies who were in production at that time. So the Timken Roller Bearing Company, they raised about a million dollars for the Victory Loan Campaign. 330 employees from Timken served in the war. And of course, you can find Timken bearings in motor trucks and passenger cars. They also made boat davits and airplane parts. So all from Stark County, Ohio. The Diebold Safe and Lock Company, uh, they produced bulletproof quality tank armor. And uh, their quote in the honor roll book says, uh, during peace times, our product is for safeguarding the wealth of our country. During war times, our product was used in safeguarding the lives of the boys of our country. So very much uh, a safety uh, company. Uh, they had 100 employees that served in the war. The uh, Gilliam Manufacturing Company in Canton, they were actually the very first gas mask manufacturers in the United States. Uh, obviously, we had never seen mustard gas before, so this was new. So how do we make uh, gas masks? Uh, we had no model to work from, uh, so they had to figure it out from scratch. They ended up using rubberized silk from Goodyear Tire and Rubber in Akron. And uh, any small hole in any of those pieces uh, would render it useless. So uh, they finally figured out a good way to make them. Uh, get a machine to build them, uh, and by 1918 they were producing them at 11 gas masks per minute. So really decent progress. Uh, the Hoover Company, uh, of course the uh, uh, vacuum cleaner manufacturers, they actually began their war contract back in 1915 uh, before America had joined the war. And by 1918 all of the production that came out of that company was war related. They made leather straps, gun covers, tarps, coal bags, canvas buckets. I like to think of that as like the bag of the vacuum cleaner. They just kind of like repurposed it to bigger things for the war. And more than two million pieces uh, were actually manufactured at Hoover. Uh, Central Steel and Maskelin also uh, contributed $1.5 million in Liberty Bonds. Uh, 175 employees served during the war. And they made 250,000 tons of forgings and parts. Uh, so they contributed to airplanes, trucks, guns, ships, and other vehicles. Now the really cool one, well I guess cool isn't really the term I want. Uh, this is the Reynolds, uh, Reynolds Machine Company in Massillon, which I had never heard of until uh, I started researching. They were tasked with designing and manufacturing a machine to close the shells that held mustard gas. Because of course you can't have a person doing that because you've got all of those fumes and things that would be really, really bad. So they had to come up with a machine that could close the shells uh, that they would actually send down a tunnel to close. Um, so they, that is their big claim to fame here in Massillon. And uh, the biggest contri contributor would be the Griscom Russell Company. Uh, they made all kinds of extractors and coolers and heaters for oil. Um, but their big thing is that 95% of all Navy vessels uh, that were uh, made during this time had something from the Griscom Russell Company in it. So 95% of all Navy vessels had something from Maslin, Ohio. So very cool. 
Uh, and of course, we like things to be named after us. So the Maslin Bridge Company, uh, they uh, were working on war production and they had a ship named after them. So the 87th ship launched uh, during the war, uh, actually launched in 1919. Uh, so the Maslin Bridge. So where do women fall into all of this? You've got soldiers, you've got manufacturing. So how did we uh, contribute to the war effort? Uh, the American Red Cross, oh wait, no, I lied, one back, one back. Uh, of course, women uh, had to take the place of men in the workplace. So all of those manufacturing places depend on manpower, but if all of your men are at war, how do you do that? So many, uh, approximately one million women went into the workplace, uh, many in munitions factories. Uh, of course, after the war, they were expected to leave so that the boys coming home uh, could go back to their jobs and provide for their families. It wasn't until uh, World War II that many women got to stay in their workplaces after the war. Uh, and of course, providing billions of pounds of ammo. Okay, Red Cross. More. Massillon, in 1917, formed a chapter of the American Red Cross. Uh, their board of directors was made up of the president of the Chamber of Commerce, the mayor of Massillon, and the president of the Social Service League. Uh, they were working to assist in the war effort, things that you don't think of. Uh, so they made 110,000 gauze dressings, 3,200 sweaters, and 3,913 pairs of socks. Uh, so those women were hard at work. And uh, the total registered workers for Massillon in the surrounding area was 19,492 women. So quite a lot of women. All right, now, can anybody tell me where on earth this building is? Because this is where the American Red Cross was stationed, and I can't figure out what building this is. State Hospital? It's not the Women's Club. No. State Hospital? Maybe a building in the State Hospital, potentially? I don't know. Well, if anybody thinks, they might know where it is. I would love to talk to you afterwards. Yes? It's up there in Lake Away. Mm, I think that one's a little bit too stone-like. Yeah, here, Marty, vote. <laughs> it's supposed to be on 4th Street, but I think it's the Mass and Social Club at the corner of 4th and Federal. It's a church. 4th and Federal, thank you. It's the church now. Okay. The church on the corner of 4th and Federal. Thank you, Marty, vote. <laughs> Uh, and of course, uh, all of these women, you've got 19,000 women who registered to help with the American Red Cross. It provided great social opportunities for women. Uh, so after the war ended, uh, they realized that they wanted to still hang out together. Uh, so they decided to form a Massillon Women's Club in 1919. And Edna McClymonds Wales was kind enough to offer Five Oaks, uh, the Women's Club today, as a good meeting place. And uh, at the very first organizational meeting of the Massillon Women's Club, 400 women uh, attended. So it became a really, really big, uh, big organization. Now, unfortunately, during the war, we are, we Americans are fighting for the rights of the other countries. But women still didn't have the right to vote. So why would we fight for others' rights when we didn't have the right ourselves? So women really took to the streets uh, and trying to get uh, the legislators to let them have the right to vote. So here's a woman holding a poster that says Kaiser Wilson. That's a good way to get the president's attention if you call him the Kaiser. Uh, so women uh, took to the streets. Uh, they even uh, approached a delegation from Russia in 1917. Go ahead and show that back there, you can't see. Um, in 1917, a Russian delegation was driving to the White House and suffragists actually unfurled a banner uh, that reminded them that they were still enfranchised and that they uh, were being held down by President Wilson. So it's a good way to get people's attention. Uh, and of course, they took it to the White House, uh, protesting outside on a regular basis. And by 1918, President Wilson finally changed his mind. Uh, so he started the conversation about women's suffrage and considered it to be a war measure. Because if you've got all these women protesting, there's no one working in the munitions factories. So the 19th Amendment was finally uh, uh, approached. 
Uh, it prohibited state or federal sex-based restrictions on voting, and it was officially finally ratified by all of the states in 1920. So not until after World War I did women have the right to vote. So something to keep in mind, it was not that long ago, less than 100 years ago. Uh, and of course, African Americans in the war, surprise, surprise, something that you don't typically hear about, which I think is silly. So these are the Harlem Hellfighters. Uh, they fought in France and actually earned uh, the War Cross, the Croix de Guerre from France, uh, because of their valor. Um, people still actually had a fear of arming African Americans at this time, so not much had really changed in, in the thought process of Americans uh, since the Civil War. But 350,000 African Americans did serve in segregated units during the war. All right. So here's my fun multimedia portion. Uh, of course, the war is talked about in many films, books, and music. And if you want to hear more of these down on the lower level with the video, there is uh, more. And I love that all of my coworkers go around singing it because these are very catchy tunes. Uh, but this one I would love for you to hear. This was written uh, in 1917. This is sung by Billy Murray. And uh, many of you, if you remember it, please sing along because this was then again used in World War II. <laughs>
Uh, of course, when you have soldiers in close quarters, you have troops moving all over the world, it spreads very fast. Uh, many of them had weakened systems from uh, malnutrition, uh, using of that chemical warfare, uh, so it spread very quickly and attacked many people. Uh, between 10 and 20% of those who were infected uh, did die, and over uh, the entire world, the estimates, of course you can't tell because some of the symptoms are very similar to other things, uh, but the estimates are between 50 and 100 million people did die from the flu. Just so you understand, it killed more people in two years than in 100 years of the Black Death. Now, there were a lot more people uh, in 1914 than uh, the time of the Black Death, but it killed that many. Uh, of course, it did contribute to the balance of the war. Here in Massillon, just to tell you how bad it was with the 700 reported cases that we had, they canceled football games. <laughs> it was that bad. It was terrible. They, yeah. So, of course, they closed schools, churches, everywhere that they could have large groups of people. So, yes, they did cancel both professional and high school uh, games. The good news is that all of this awfulness does come to an end. Uh, so an armistice, or a lay down of arms, was called on November 11th. It was the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month uh, that we all decided, all of the heads of the, the countries involved decided, let's just stop. There's really no point to this. Uh, so at the end of the war, um, Let's see. Uh, President Wilson, of course, wanted us to be involved so that we could be involved in the peace talks. Uh, he came up with 14 points. Uh, the French Prime Minister, Clemenceau, uh, snarkily remarked that the good Lord only had 10, and he didn't understand why Wilson had to have 14, <laughs> which was great. But basically, he wanted everything to go back to the way it was. So these were his suggestions to everybody. Uh, he wanted the uh, peace talks to be diplomatic and public, so everybody knew what was going on. A reduction of arms, so everybody stopped making guns. Uh, let the Russian Revolution play out. Of course, the Russian Revolution happening at this time, and we wanted to just let them do their thing. Uh, and he called for a general association of nations to be formed, uh, which would be the League of Nations, and then replaced by that as the United Nations in 1946. So a very progressive idea on his part. Unfortunately, we never ratified the points, and we never really quite bought into that. Uh, but everyone else did. We didn't join the United Nations until many years later. Uh, fun fact, uh, America actually didn't uh, end its involvement in World War I until July 2nd, 1921, because we couldn't agree on, on all of the things, so we were still technically involved until 1921. Uh, but the uh, war does officially come to an end at the Treaty of Versailles on uh, June 28, 1919, the fifth anniversary of Archduke Franz Ferdinand's assassination. So all told, uh, there were 15 million, between 15 and 19 million dead, and uh, including the wounded, all casualties taken into account, there were between 22 and 23 million people. So a world conflict to be sure. Uh, and a hundred years later, there you go, uh, this photograph is an aerial photograph in France of the trenches. They actually still exist today. So the scars on the land are still visible. Uh, of course, in America, we don't have any battlefields attached to that. So there is quite a removed sense of participation uh, in that. But there are still places that have landmines and they do have warnings on many of those trenches. So if you go to Europe and you see trenches, don't go in them. <laughs> it would be really bad. Uh, and of course, we have to pay for the war. So in the peace treaty, we included Article 231 called the War Guilt Clause. And we assessed that Germany was at fault. Everything was Germany's fault. And we requested that they pay $442 billion to the Allied powers. Now, as we talked about in the beginning, whose fault was it? It wasn't Germany's war. It wasn't our war. It was Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. So unfortunately, Germany bears the blame. Now, unfortunately, this leads to a huge depression in Germany. Uh, they, they were required to be demilitarized, uh, but the German people, there were, there's photographs and stories of uh, housewives taking entire wheelbarrows full of money to go and buy a loaf of bread. That is how bad their depression was. Uh, our depression was bad, but theirs was worse because, again, we, we blamed them. So the unfortunate part is that a young World War I soldier uh, named Adolf Hitler comes in and says, you know what? 
it wasn't our fault, and I don't take very kindly to being blamed for this, so we should fix this. So he finds the scapegoat in the Jewish people. He rises to power, promising to get Germany back on its feet. And of course, the German people, having been in this horrible depression for more than 10 years, sign up and get on board the, uh, uh, with Hitler's points. So, of course, everything after that that they agree to, such as concentration camps and those kinds of things, not okay. Uh, but Hitler had promised to fix everything. So uh, that is how we start the road to World War II. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, what did Mexico say when uh, Germany sent them the telegram? Mexico did not want to get involved with the war, so they stayed out of it. They were like, nope, mm, yeah. nope. Okay. Yep. Yes, ma'am. What was Japan's involvement? Japan's involvement, good question. Not really good on the uh, Pacific side of the war. I'm not sure. I know that the Ottoman Empire was involved and Japan was involved. Probably, I don't think we fought anywhere over in the, the Pacific. Don't know. Yes. When was the camp uh, used up on uh, the Oak Knoll Park? That was Civil War. Yeah, the Oak Knoll Park uh, was used as a camp, uh, but for the Civil War. Where's the term mustering out come from? Christopher? Where does that term come from? Mustering out. When you join the army, you must take an oath. So you are mustered in through the oath. So when you leave the army, you sign a document releasing you, your commanding officer does the same, so it is releasing you from that oath. And that's but why muster? Why muster? I don't know why the term. Roll call. Roll call? That could be it. Good question. Yes. Wasn't uh, Hitler actually Austrian? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, he was. So that's why he was. Yeah, <laughs> that's why he was angry. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, after the war, Austria and Hungary become two very separate countries and uh, get shrunk down uh, very far. Uh, the country of Poland is formed after the war uh, as part of Russia's. Uh, they they kind of form Poland out of that section of Germany. Uh, yeah, so we take away a lot of their land. France gets their Alsace-Lorraine region back, so they're happy. Mandy. Question in the back. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned the pandemic of 1918. Do you have any numbers for vaccinary? I know I've, I've read that in the week, just one week of October 26th in 1918, 1,541 Ohio. Okay, I don't know the actual death count, and again, those are all estimates, but there were 700 reported cases in Massillon. So I bet if the number holds true, there could have been about 70 people who died. Correct, yeah, there's between 10 and 20% of those who were infected did die, then yeah, between 70 and 100 people. I had read a few years ago, Okay, yeah, and sometimes they will, if you go into a cemetery and you find the section that's 1918, you will see a lot that die within that period of time. And some do say that they did die of the influenza pandemic, yes. Two points. Somebody asked about Mexico. Mexico was deeply involved in its own problems. There was revolution going on. Mexico, uh, Pancho Villa invaded the... Texas, uh, we responded and we actually fought in Mexico in 1916. The largest last cavalry charge for the United States cavalry occurred in Mexico in 1916. Um, also an outcome of World War I that we are dealing with today was the artificial establishment of boundaries in the Middle East, creating Iran, Iraq, and the others, and it was artificial, taking into account no population centers, so it mixed everybody up, and we're dealing with that today. So that came out of World War One. Well, how about that for a 45-minute whirlwind history?